Hey there, I'm Jen Therian, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a former nine to fiver that dove into entrepreneurship eight years ago with zero business experience. I'm a wife, mama of two young girls, boutique owner, jewelry designer, and now the proud owner and coach leading Goldie Links Permanent Jewelry. I have a passion to empower fellow business babes. This podcast is made to equip you with everything you need to succeed, from actionable marketing steps to digging deep on your mindset. I know firsthand the heart, hard work, and let's be real, at times a struggle that makes up this amazing journey. You want to know what has enabled me to shine the brightest? Coaching plus community. Here at Goldie Links, we share openly, educate, and lift each other up. Expect to get linked with fellow PJ owners that will do just that, sprinkled with plenty of fun along the way. Competition is an old school thought and connection is the way. Get ready to feel inspired. Welcome to the Goldie Links podcast. All your legal questions answered. I'm sitting down with Alyssa from Legal Doer. She is amazing, giving us all the 411 to set up your business for success and have peace of mind. From waivers, the structure of your business, contracts, it's all here for you, along with the waiver that she's offering specifically for permanent jewelers. So makes it easy for you. I'm all about ease when it comes to these things. <laughs> so we are making legal fun. I hope you dive in and get all the info that you need. Enjoy. I'm so excited that you're here with us today. This is Alyssa from Legal Doer, and she is going to tell us all the things I never want to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, tell us about yourself. I want to hear all about how you started, why you want to be a lawyer, where you are in your entrepreneur journey. Thank you so much for having me, first and foremost. It's been mm -hmm. wonderful just getting to know you, and thank you for giving me this platform and opportunity to speak with you today. So a little bit about me. So I hate telling the story because it's so personal, but I think it's so important to share because it sheds light onto why legal is so important. But yeah. a little over a year ago, my dad was in a terrible car accident. And while he was in the hospital, his trusted employees went and basically poached all of his clients, right? No so way. his 40 year business <gasps> was completely destroyed and taken out from under him no and way. did not have contracts in place to protect him. What did so he do? Do you mind me asking what was his business? Uh, what did he do? He had a pool business. Okay. Yeah. So for like over 40 years now, very established account clients that were very obviously loyal to my father, but they didn't hear from him because he was in the hospital and oh, they told the clients that my dad had retired. So the story made sense. Like they were totally bamboozled. The clients at that point, the accounts had already been transferred and completely poached. Anyway, it is what it is. But even as his attorney daughter, I didn't realize that my dad didn't have these legal things in place. Oh. And had we had the proper contracts in place, we could have done something about it. But literally there was nothing I could do. And it was in that moment that I had a lot of friends with the pandemic starting their online businesses. And I was just like mm -hmm. sick to my stomach that like me as a lawyer, because it's so expensive to go to a law firm, right? 5.15 yes. an hour. I couldn't even afford me. <laughs> you know? right? like, oh <laughs> They're starting this business. And I was like, I do not want this legal nightmare to happen to my friends and family again. And yeah. I need to make the law more accessible, right? To like, wow just online business owners and creatives. So that's really what got me started. And it's been a passion project of mine. I love legal. I know I'm weird when it comes to that, but a contract, <laughs> you can pay you me all needed. day to sit here and negotiate well, contracts and write contract yes. terms. Basically, that's how I got started. And I've been growing ever since just wherever the need arises to really make it a point that People get their legal in place. And I understand we all got started in these. A lot of us got started in these businesses besides, besides me to be creatives and to hone in on what you liked. And I think you even told me this. <laughs> I'm like, I hear this all the time where you're like, I do not want to deal with the legal, the bookkeeping, the accounting, the insurance, all that stuff is nope. so daunting and it's just take it off my plate. But once you get it done, it really does give you that peace of mind and it really helps you with your business operations and you're yes. just able to really go back to focusing on why you got into business. It's almost like you can start a business without doing it, but until something like that happens, like with your father, then you're like, oh my gosh, like I should have had this in place. And then, then there goes your business. So it's obviously so important to set up the bones like of your business with these things. And like yeah. you said, I feel too, most people that go into business, like permanent jewelry is, this sounds like fun. We love jewelry. We're creatives. Yeah. Like you're not 
thinking about all the other stuff. You're just no. thinking about the stuff you have to do to grow your business. And that doesn't really come into mind, even though it's super necessary. And like you said, it's, it's intimidating to go to, who do you contact? That's how I feel. Yeah. And that's why it's amazing. You have so, we'll talk about this, but you have so many amazing like templates and things that people can use that for small businesses and online business, which is amazing. It makes it easy. And then also your Instagram, I was just like devouring it the last couple of days. And you literally have a post that I was laughing so hard because also we were talking about this. You have two young children, right? Yes. I so got we were talking about just that. turned five and two. Oh my gosh. Oh my Thanks. gosh. Oh yeah. Okay. So you have a two-year-old. Okay. I have a three and a five-year-old, so I can totally relate. Oh. And but you're, there's one reel that's hilarious. It's like, being a creator or an online entrepreneur is knowing that you need solid contracts and legal protection to safeguard your business. But also you would rather sing Baby Shark on repeat for a year than deal with the legal stuff. And I'm like, everyone that has young kids obviously can relate because Baby Shark on end is like, you want to like literally bang your head against the wall, but you'd rather do that than deal yeah. I with get legal it. stuff. I get it. Yes, I get it. Oh, it's like, Yes. Where do you even start? Like, where and like we were talking before, which most people, a lot, a lot of people are doing this, are in this boat of being moms as well. And again, it's one more thing that you have to worry about. And having a, a, your own business, you have to wear so many hats and like mm -hmm. do all the things. So let's dive in. What is the first thing that you need to do when you decide I want to have a permanent jewelry business? What do you need to do? Okay. So first and foremost, what kind of business entity are you going to form? Are you going to go into business as a sole proprietorship, which is just you as an indiv individual doing business, or yeah. are you going to set up a limited liability company? And yeah. that's going to be your first order of business. Now, I would say uh, it's is really, obviously my lawyer response would be your first thing is get your LLC, but I know that's not necessarily a realistic response. So I would say if you're just trying to decide between a sole proprietorship or an LLC, think about whether you want to have that personal liability protection. Hmm. So as a sole prop, the business is you, you are the business. There's no separation. Okay. If you're an LLC, then it's technically a separate entity. So yes. you're the managing member of the LLC. So the business obligations, the business debts, if you ever get sued for anything and there's a judgment, if you are operating your LLC correctly and you're mm -hmm. not mingling funds or commingling funds, you have your operating agreement in place and everything is set up properly, then your LLC is the one that's getting sued not you personally. So your home, your car, all that stuff is not on the hook because you set everything up correctly and you are separate and distinct. Now that's all well and good. And you're like, okay, I do want that personal liability protection, but does it make sense for me at this moment when I'm just starting out? Do I want to invest in that extra step? Right? Cause it's an okay. extra step. Mm -hmm. I would say, ask yourself these five things. One, what is the cost to start and operate an LLC in your state? Okay. Some states are like $50 to file and get an LLC. It's not yeah. cost prohibitive, right? right? But in places like here in California, it's $70 or $70 or $90 to file. And then it's $800 for a franchise tax every single year. That may oh, not wow. make sense to you. So figure out what those filing requirements, the mandatory annual reporting requirements, any filing fees along with does my state have minimum annual tax or franchise tax requirements? So how much does it cost me to mm -hmm. set up this LLC? Second, okay. do you want to claim your business name? You, do you want to own that name on the state level? Obviously, for you don't own it federally unless you file a trademark, but do you want to mm -hmm. prevent others from owning it in your state? The third one is how much personal assets do you have or do you plan on having? Because if you're broke, there's not much to protect, to be completely honest. <laughs> you're what we call judgment proof because yeah. if anyone were to bring a judgment against you, you can't milk a dry cow, so they say. Sure, right? sure. The next one is how much money are you going to earn under your LLC? So there's a certain tax election. I'm sure everyone called, has heard it before. It's called an S-Corp tax election. It's actually still an LLC. Just for tax purposes, you are an S-Corp. 
So when you get to make around seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars net profits, that's mm-hmm. when you're going to want to potentially talk to your CPA or accountant about electing an S corp to save money on taxes. So that's when you mm-hmm. definitely have to have that LLC in place to be able to become the S corp for tax purposes. And then the last but not least, to ask yourself is what are the legal risks in my niche? industry? Like how lawsuit prone are people in what it is that I'm doing? Right. And based on those, figure out if it makes sense for you to get that LLC or to keep operating as a sole prop. Okay. And do you know of anywhere where they have a list of a state by state of how much it is? And do you know of anything like that off the top? Okay. Okay. So I want to ask you first, because I did find something and I will check the legitimacy of it, but I'm going to post a link in the show notes because I did find a great where it was state by state and told you the fee of every LLC and gave you some guidelines, which I think is amazing. So I'm just going to make sure that they keep it current because I know that stuff can change, but that's, it was such a great resource I found because, but so sole proprietor, what is compared to LLC? Is there a fee to be a sole proprietor or no? Cause you're just on your, you're not. You're, yeah, there's nothing that you're filing. There's no paperwork. Like you there just, is no paperwork. Okay. No, it's not just you. To, yeah. To be yourself. To be yourself, you cannot, you don't have to file anything. It's like declare. You basically, for tax purposes, you declare, I have the intention of making money and now I'm a business. And you're interesting. Okay. But when you do it that way, can you still file for a seller's permit and things like that? No. Or do you need? Okay. And this is a great question because you don't have to file anything to form yourself as a sole prop. That doesn't mean you don't have paperwork. Okay. So like (laughs) the second step is regardless if you form a sole prop or sole proprietorship as you, as the individual, or if you go ahead and form that LLC, you're still going to need to file for what you called your resale or your seller's permit to collect and remit sales tax. You also need to look into your general business licensing requirements and any local legal compliance. And you are going to need to file for those, whether you're an LLC or whether you're a sole prop. Okay. So you can still, of course, yeah, remit sales tax, collect sales tax, get a, because we were talking about this. You said seller's permit. I always call it a resale tax license. I know over here in Colorado, whether or not they're named different things in different states, but that's obviously how I'm buying wholesale, what I use to file my sales tax. So you can do that regardless if you're, however you structure your business. In fact, you have to. Yes. Yes. You have to. You have to. Yeah. Okay. And then when also EIN, where does that fit in? So you also, everyone has to get an EIN, correct? So it's optional if you are a sole prop. Okay. It's definitely would do that as an LLC where you, because then you don't, it's basically your business's social security number. So as an LLC, you do need to get that federal EIN because then it attaches to you for tax purposes. Um, it. Because it's a different entity than you, it needs its own social security number. Um as an LLC, you do need to get that federal EIN. As a sole prop, you don't technically need it unless you're hiring employees. There are, uh, There's other little requirements in there, but from a general standpoint, no, you don't have to get it. If you want to hide your social security number, say, because you have W-9s or other tax forms that you want, you can apply for that federal EIN number so that you can, uh, so that you can show that instead of your social. So it's an optional for Mm -hmm. a lot of general purposes. And before we get more into that, I need to put in my lovely legal disclaimer that although I am a lawyer, this is all being provided for general and informational purposes only. Because obviously when it comes to your state, your local requirements and your situation personally, it's best to really seek out a lawyer or get that legal advice to your situation specifically, but yeah, this is all more like general generalizations. Okay. And then I'm just going to backtrack really quick. When you said LLC and if it's structured correctly, where you have all the correct paperwork, you're literally making me think, I'm like, oh my gosh, do I? I want to, I know we don't maybe cover that right now, but I know you have a great bundle that's the things you need in place when you, you're, it's more geared towards online business. But again, like you said, even a permanent jewelry business, they can go through and make sure and go through all these steps as we're talking about. Do you cover that? in that yes. bundle, like all the, pay, everything you need to oh, file. The mini, the mini course. course. 
Yes, I go over. It's like a roadmap of here's module one of pick your right. LLC. Yes, I go over all of this. And although it is geared more towards online businesses and like digital products, so instead yes. of, oh, this is optional for sales tax because you're a physical business, it'd be like, oh, I have to get that. So yes, it definitely right. covers that and all of the legal, because obviously there's so much, right? Yes, there's so much. And that's why I actually want to ask a question about tax, which we were talking about that because it's, is this a lawyer question or is this a CPA question? But when it comes to actually, because dealing a lot with online and digital products, what exactly, because we, as we know, services don't have to be taxed. Okay. So, yes, for the most part. But of course, we're selling a product with a service. Like we're doing permanent jewelry. They're obviously buying a chain. Okay. So it, it does have to be taxed, correct? Yes. So yes. So that's why I, the online course is basically, that would be literally like the only major difference is yes. that sales tax is sometimes optional for certain states. But when it comes to physical, tangible goods, those are mm-hmm. always going to be taxed. You're okay. always going to need to if your state obviously has sales tax. And it's okay. not even just like state, it's like state, county, and city. Oh Woohoo! <laughs> you know, it's so fun. Um, okay. And then... Okay, let's move on to waivers, because I feel like this is also a question a lot that I see if they if people really need a waiver. I know we can meet when I reached out to you originally, I was like, because we did even some research on on our own, because we actually I have not. I'm going to be honest, I have not had any waivers yet. So we're looking to implement them. But it was a discussion where it seems to be like you don't need a waiver if you have the correct insurance and you have, again, an LLC because, but that protects you. So cover that. Like, why do you need a waiver? And what, okay. what if, okay, yeah, let's start there. If okay. Do you feel you need a waiver? Yes, 100%. <laughs> okay. 100%, yes. So with, say something happens, say the machine malfunctions and you, heaven forbid, burn someone, which I know is so not so uncommon. I don't even know if it's even happened, but let's say it happens or someone gets injured in your, you have a brick and mortar and someone gets injured and you don't have a waiver, but you do have insurance and LLC. So what happens there? Say they were to sue you or something. or So it's, it's like your own little legal bundle, right? So I would look at it as a permanent jewelry jeweler. I would look at it like a stool. And so you need three legs. <laughs> to sit on that comfortably with l- true legal peace of mind. To be able to sit yes. on that stool, you need all three. And all three is going to be your business insurance, it's going to be your LLC, and it's going to be your waiver. And they're all going to function slightly differently and they're going to save your booty so yes. much depending on the situation. And you're, we're not fortune tellers, right? Like we can't mm-hmm. like, okay, this X and X situation. Like you want to protect yourself against all of those things. So if someone comes in and there's a welding accident, you accidentally burn the customer. Is that waiver going to protect you? It depends. Is your LLC going to protect you? It depends. Is the yes. insurance going to cover it? It depends. But wouldn't you want, wouldn't you want all three? Right. So with right. the waiver, if you say that you were negligent, Okay. So you, you weren't following like the standard practices of what a typical jeweler should do. And that is why you burned the customer. That waiver is not going to help you because it's not going to protect you against your own, either your intentional misdeeds or because you not just an accident, but an accident that you could have foresaw and you didn't prevent against. That waiver is not going to help you. Right. If on the other hand, there was a problem with the jewelry that wasn't, there was a problem with actual material or say the customer themselves unexpectedly moved and got burned. Now the waiver is going to protect you. And what I mean by protection is it's going to give you your best possible defense in the case Mm -hmm. of a lawsuit or better yet, before you even get to that lawsuit, say like the customer's sitting there like, oh my gosh, you just burnt me. And now they're coming at you saying, you need to pay my medical bills. And you're like, I'm so sorry. First of all, I'm so sorry this happened, but that's why we had the waiver in place. Yeah. And you agreed that if something happened, like you moved, that I wouldn't be liable for that. Although I'm like super right. sorry that this happened, you don't have a legal claim. And maybe they'll walk away at that point. Or you can settle and you can have a mediator be like, you have no legal case. It's just, there's so many different factors to consider. But for me, that's why I say absolutely yes. Because yeah, there's no, yeah, exactly. There's no downside to covering yourself in every way you can, right? Just in case, because hopefully these things are 
few and far between. But of course, when they happen, they can be super devastating, right? Yep. So even right. if you say you, it's like taking off one of those legs, like I was thinking of it, like, okay, say you have a waiver and an LLC that covers you more, I guess, in your business, but you don't have insurance. So, so then like, how, yeah, exactly. So the insurance is going to be the one that helps you pay for it, right? Maybe, right. And it depends on the exclusions. Again, insurance isn't the whole 100%. There's pros and cons to that one too, because maybe they have exclusions to it. Maybe they exclude your negligence. Maybe they exclude those, the things that the waiver would have covered, right? Mm -hmm. Or say for instance, so now I'm losing my train of thought. You're fine. You're <laughs> um, fine. What was it? What was I going to say? Oh, just so they're not perfect. Right. So usually with all three, you can just cover yourself from those unexpected things. Right. Because you never want to be made the example. Right? I know it's true. And then I even thinking, I don't know, knock on wood, I've never been in court or like I brought to court. Or thing. But I was like, say you did, obviously doesn't it make you also just seem, I don't want to say make you, make you be legit, but if you went there and saying, Hey, I have this waiver, I have insurance and I have this, like I have all these things in place and this happened rather than just setting up and not having anything in place. And then of course it looks like you're very, I got, I want to use the word unprofessional, but just not, you're not a legit business or something. More like amateur. Right. It really, it really lifts you up to be like, look, I have all my bases covered and mm -hmm. don't mess with me. <laughs> right. And also, depending, you want to think the best of people, but obviously there are people out there that will jump right to wanting to do something legally or something that, that exists. I'm sure. I'm sure you've Actually, seen that. Actually here in America. Yes. Yes. And, but if they know that you have, oh, they signed a waiver, but if they see they, they, they didn't, they know they have maybe an oppor open opportunity to be like, I didn't 100%. sign anything. So yep. it's just almost like the mindset of the customer too. Yes. If they walk away and something happened, they're like, oh, I actually signed this. But if I didn't, anyway, it yes. does, it leaves opportunities to not. <laughs> I, and open. I think that's, yes, a hundred percent. Cause I, I've even had that in myself because I'm trustworthy. I have integrity. I, yeah. I'm like, I don't think of those things. And then I've recently had that same thing where a customer took advantage of one of the things that I was just like, dang, like I didn't even realize that they could take advantage of my integrity. And it's like, they can yeah. use that stuff against you. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm trusting. And yeah. exactly what we said, you don't know who you're dealing with and it's better to just cover all the bases. And it's simple mm -hmm. enough. I know that's the extra paperwork. It's getting their signature on it and their date, the date of it. But there are electronic apps and there's are electronic services. Just like even when you go to the gym or you take your kids to the jumpy or whatever yes, it is, yes. you have the little iPad, you have the little tablet, you have the POS, like you can have it on there where it's here's your liability way. As long as they can scroll through that bad boy mm -hmm. and they have to click, I accept to it and they have their electronic mm -hmm. signature. You're good. You don't have to make it into a long drawn out thing. And is, you do need a signature and a date for it yes. to be legally binding. Is that what, yes. right? Okay. I just want to put that out there, but we already spoke prior to doing this that we're, we, Alyssa is going to put together an amazing waiver template specifically for permanent jewelers so that that can be purchased. And then it's just a template that they can plug in, right? Yes. Can they edit that like to what they, they wouldn't even need to, they wouldn't even need to, they okay, would literally okay. just Put in their business name. Make it super easy. Let's not make this yes. complicated. Right. And then when we do have that waiver, say they purchase your template, how, what do you think the best way is people probably don't want a bunch of like paper, actual paper. Oh, for so sure. would they, how would they be able to utilize that maybe digitally? Like how would they use that? I would get one of those managing services through the apps or the document services where it is a simple, just electronic document that you scroll mm -hmm. down, click I accept, and then they electronically sign it. And then it's stored okay. for that customer. Either okay. it's at the point of checkout. So they're standing there, they're getting you getting ready to give you their credit card or the cash. And they're like, before you make this purchase, please click and read through this disclaimer. You have those little, Perfect. those little screens that you can have, or you can bring on a tablet or your phone simple, or it can just okay. be on a piece of paper. But I know that can be really tedious to keep track of. I know it's one of those things. We looked into oh. some waiver apps and whatnot. And I know there's a lot of people talk about, so we'll put that in the show notes too. And just our comparison, because I know there's some that are free and then over a certain amount yeah. of waivers you do a month, it's paid. And so there are Google forms might be a good one. I, again, I'm, not too schooled in this, but I think that there are a lot of options, like you said. And even if you wanted to make it technically non-digital and free, you could just print them out and have them yeah. sign it, right? And just file it yeah, away. And but scan it. Yeah, or scan it and be like, okay, scan and then name, done. Yeah, true. Okay, great. Okay, so that's awesome. So with waivers, when does, and then I'm going to move on to contracts. So granted, I don't, I think when anyone would need a contract, right, is obviously when they have more of a brick and mortar, maybe they have employees, 
right? Yes. When do you need a contract in place? Okay. So anytime you're exchanging your services or you're getting paid, you want to have a contract in place. And mainly it's just so that both parties are on the same page. Yes. Me personally, I'm like contracts are so good at saying, okay, where are we? Are we on the same page? And then also you're able to implement business boundaries. Hey, this is what we agreed to. You can always blame it on the contract and point and say, yeah. hey, perfect, this is the contract. This is it. Right. So obviously you brought up employees. You definitely need to have an employee agreement. I don't care if it's at will. You want to have that there. You also, especially if you're hiring independent contractors, you're going to want to have something there. So anytime you're exchanging something, it's just, mm -hmm. it's not even necessarily the legality of it, but more of what is our relationship? What's the scope of our relationship and what am I paying you for? And yeah. that way there's not this miscommunication or bad blood down the line. And it sounds like a weird, but this has popped my head. Can you put anything in a contract? No, <laughs> not necessarily. Like I mean, if somebody not. sign on it, can you put, literally put, I'm just trying to think of something like so silly, but I was like, what? I don't know. What? I don't, what, like, what can you technically put in a contract? So, so the law loves contracts. The law yes. likes when two parties come together and there's yes. a meeting of the minds and they're like, Hey, you agree to this? Heck yeah. Hey, do you agree to this? Heck yeah. And you both sign it and date it and it's done. The law loves that yes. because that's partnership. That's working together. What they don't like is one-sided contracts. And when they become what the coin termed is unconscionable. It's like, you can't force someone to do certain things. Or if you are like, say you're one party and you have a lot of legal sway, the other person doesn't. There are certain things and it can get really technical, but for the most part, as long as there's offer, acceptance, and some sort of considerations, payment, bartering time in exchange for something of value, you have a contract. And yeah. it's legally binding on both of you. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of scary because I know like with online templates and generic contracts, that's, I think for me, the scariest part because anyone can act like a lawyer. They can be a Google lawyer. And mm -hmm. I know it's easy to do, but it's also from my standpoint, makes me very nervous for people because sometimes you don't know what you're signing. And you might be taking on legal responsibility and obligations that you aren't aware of. So I'd always completely read through a contract before you sign it because there is no, oh, I didn't know that was in their defense or yeah. they didn't tell me about that. Right. You, once you sign on that dotted line, I would always 100% ask questions. And if you don't understand anything, don't sign it <laughs> because right. you may be taking on something that you don't even realize. Okay. I want to ask a question about, it was having to do with contracts. See that I always do this. There's oh, one point part where I lose my train of thought. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let me gather my thoughts. Contracts. Okay. I'm going to go back to waivers. I want to talk about, and here I'll start it again here in a second. I want to go back to talking about like the whole children's thing with the waivers. Okay. And minors. Okay. 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 Going back to the waivers there also has been a lot of discussion and I sent you some links of what I've seen in the permanent jewelry groups and about the federal like regulations when it comes to children 12 and under the lead content of jewelry. At first when I read that, I thought there was a federal regulation against permanent jewelry on children, which mm -hmm. apparently from what I see, there's not, it's more or less the right. content of the metal. So I think a lot of people are again, veering away then from doing and not wanting to deal with it and not wanting to do put permanent jewelry at all on 12 and under. Cause then the whole, conversation came up, well, can we do class? So it has nothing to do with the permanent side. It literally is just the content of the metal, right? Right. Uh, when I sent you those links and you looked over it, what was your opinion about, again, I guess this whole subject when it comes to, because it, there was something about getting a certification. And uh -huh. even though we're buying this these chains, we see what the company is telling us it's made out of, whether it's gold fill, sterling silver, pure gold, which is most of what we're dealing with. And we see there's no lead. They're telling us there's no lead. So say something were to come back where a child was affected by a piece of jewelry, there were being lead in there. Mm -hmm. What happens there? What would so protect at that? So at that point, I would close your business down and flee the country. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm like the so, end. Bye. No, no. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes, I get it. When it comes to children, the law protects 
the innocent, right? The law protects kids. So I understand from your perspective, it's okay, this is scary, right? Because we're getting into kids. Now, before I get into law part of it, when you were saying about waivers, anytime you are welding jewelry or putting jewelry on a minor, you're definitely, this is where the waiver comes in because children under the age of 18, and I say children because I know when you're like 17 or 18, when you're 17, you don't feel like a minor, but when you're under 18, at least here in America, that's the age of majority. And you technically cannot give true consent. Right. And that's what the whole informed consent waiver is all about. And so with the waivers, this is really more important when it comes to putting jewelry on minors. You definitely want to have that waiver. And the kid isn't the one that signs it. It's the parent as the parent or legal guardian that you need Mm -hmm. to get their permission. And I know just in reality, you're like, okay, but they're 17. Their parent weren't there. Then I'm going to put that in your discretion. Right. I'm going to throw it back on you and say, you, you do you, boo. You figure that out. I don't know, but if I'm going to draw a line and say, if you're dealing with 13 or 14 year old and under, I would not, I would definitely have that waiver from with a minor and their parent waiver. So then yes. back to this whole, is there a federal law? What the heck? So I saw it. It's the consumer product safety improvement act. And essentially what it's saying is that there are these certain standards for children's products. Now I hone in on the fact that you're a permanent jeweler. Like you are not selling these specifically to children. These are not children's products. So to me, that's already, okay, this doesn't apply to you. But then you're like, okay, but I'm still nervous. (laughs) And I was like, okay, but also this is a requirement for manufacturers and importers. You're Mm -hmm. not that. This is for them to certify their compliance with this whole lead standard. It's for them to provide you as the jeweler with that lead certificate. It's for, it's on them. It's their duty to tell you as a jeweler, Hey, this is pure gold. This is quality metal. Here's the purity and here's the lead content. And so that's what I guess your duty as a jeweler is to talk to and find credible manufacturers and importers of your jewelry and say, show me that certificate, show me the purity test, show me that what you're saying I'm buying is what it is. And then you have fulfilled your legal duty to verify that. Now, when you turn around and and sell that piece of jewelry, whether it's to an adult or whether to an, whether it's a child, that law does not require you to send out individual certificates for that piece of jewelry. That's right. It's not for you. <laughs> that yes. Makes sense. yes. So when it comes to, I guess my mind just went to, I know we're doing a lot of in-person, but even when it, cause I mentioned when we were talking about this, about people that sell like bracelets, for instance, clasped bracelets, beaded bracelets yeah. to children on Etsy or right. an, an, any online store. So right. because are, are they, is there, I wouldn't say they sign a waiver, but is there something online or even like through Etsy, they're not, there's nothing that they're signing saying, Hey, I agree to this. So how does that work? If you haven't, if you say. Maybe there's disclaimers, right? So like at checkout, there's a disclaimer, like, but you can't legally disclaim or put away your right under the law. If there is an actual standard that says, Hey, if you're selling children's goods, if you're showing, if you're selling children's jewelry, you need to verify that what you're selling and what you're marketing out there doesn't have X, Y, Z, then there's no really way, Mm -hmm. there's no way around that, but that's Mm -hmm. not what this law is saying. So as long as you, as the jeweler are, are looking back at the manufacturer or the, whoever you're getting the jewelry from, and you're Mm -hmm. like, just show me that this quality is the quality, then, then you're good. Okay. So say we didn't take that step, say that there was a child that came and for whatever reason we, but we did purchase this chain or whatever that does stated like what the contents were like in the description, let's say, but we didn't reach out to them specifically saying, Hey, jeweler, we need this certificate. Uh Are we then at fault of some because we didn't ask for that certificate or are we like, or we just obviously just purchasing that chain it was stated what was in, what would the materials were. And that's all we needed, right? We didn't, we, do we need to go a step further? Um, my legal response would be, it depends. <laughs> I would obviously tell you that you should take that extra step. You should verify that what you're getting yeah. is of quality. But honestly, there's, that's just too much of a variable because it comes back to not to just being a child, but say there's an allergic reaction or mm-hmm. there's something else going on there. 
that's where your waiver comes in. That's, that's where the waiver comes in. Comes yeah, in, for and sure. That's where your insurance comes in to then pay for the cost to litigate the case or pay for the cost of the judgment. But there's too many what ifs there to really give you a, a definitive answer to that. Yes, because you're right. The waiver it would say along the lines, you're agreeing to this. If you do get a reaction, basically yeah. that's again, not our, not our responsibility. Right. So that's something they're right. saying. And, on. and then eventually say you did get a piece of jewelry that was told to you, the manufacturer or the importer told you it was X, Y, and Z, and it didn't have lead in it. You can obviously, that would be your defense, right? If I were your lawyer, I'd be like, she didn't know this is what she was told. That was a intentional misrepresentation on their part. And then we would counter sue them. So there's, right. there would just, that would just be like a giant triangle thing where they're suing you and now you're suing them. <laughs> and it was Fun one times. big happy family for a couple of years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Good to know. I feel like when we, again, anyone who sees anything, they want to avoid and whatever you feel comfortable with. I think what it comes down to yeah. too, I do it by case basis too. When if I get yeah. children, I definitely talk to the parent about and just feel it out really and go with my gut yeah. when it comes to something like that. But again, <clears throat> dealing with a different, even the going forward, having a waiver, which will make me feel even better. It's, yeah, that. Does it give me peace of mind? Yeah. yeah don't just sure. do it if you're like, oh, I'm just, does that help you? <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Otherwise you're not going to yes. do it. Because I've had people actually come with their child. And again, and this is, I typically don't do try to do anyone really three or four under, honestly, yeah. at that point. But I have had people come to me that actually were upset by they went to another permanent jeweler and they wouldn't put it on their child and they were like mad about it. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. but again, we're all trying to do what's right for us, obviously. And you got to respect, of course, you know, what they feel is right. But it's just, it's again, it's this gray area where people are like, can we or can we not? When no one wants to, no one wants to be in any legal I, trouble and no one wants I to hurt know. anybody. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. it's totally true. And then, especially because it's permanent jewelry, you have to decide at that point from your more of a moral ethical standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not even necessarily mm -hmm. like a legal thing, but then like you decide whether you're okay with that or not. Because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is then to resent your customers or to resent and be like, to then be thinking about that. You don't mm -hmm. want it to weigh on your energy and on your mind, but right. then maybe in that kind of situation, you're like, okay, I will end up doing it, but only if you sign this saying that, that I don't recommend this, but that I'm willing to do it as long as you agree right. to issue anything happen. But honestly, something to be aware of, and one last thing we'll talk about with the children or underage is could there, as permanent jewelry, of course, is somewhat new, right? So as it rolls out, is there, there's a possibility there could be maybe a federal regulation or a state by state, right? Could there be a state regulation when it comes to permanent jewelry of you can, no, no child under this oh, age yeah. can get it. There, that right. can happen, right? Oh, for okay. sure. Yeah. Then we would have a state by state, even just even with the lead, right? There's different right. state things. California has its own regulations that imposes mm -hmm. on children's jewelry, but but yes, it can definitely be state by state. And we just, we don't currently have that yet. So it's it something is something that's so new. Yeah. Right. Just something to stay aware of. And what would be the easiest way to know if something did pop up about that? Like a, a Google alert? Well, what if something popped up and you weren't aware of it? I mean, there would need to be a lawsuit, right? I feel like there would need to be like a representative or someone who something mm -hmm. terrible happened to. And I'm yes. like, but if they're going to allow piercings, then I don't see why they wouldn't allow. I know. Jewelry. Yes. And I think that's a problem too. I think it's so new that when people hear the word permanent jewelry, they go right to the fact of you're embedding it in their skin. So I think like- That's what they think. Yes. They think that yes. it's like a permanent piercing. Okay. Because yeah, you're right. Really with so many things, I was asking about that too, if you're aware of tattooing underage or piercing, as far as I know, yeah, there's no regulation. It goes back to the yeah. It goes yeah. Back it's to the it's parent also permission a, and are you putting the child yes. in danger, right? So yes. eventually that's through the parent and the child's relationship and whether someone steps in to protect the child from the parent, right? right? Yeah, because I, I tried getting a tattoo when I was 17. <laughs> Really? <laughs> and I could not. My friends were 18 oh. and they could. Thankfully, I didn't because now okay. it's funny. Okay. You think what back. Would you have like, gotten? What have you, of course, like a butterfly, like tramp stamp or something. So, <laughs> it would have been so good now. What are you it's talking about? Low back tattoo, right? So happy it didn't happen really. But at the time I was so disappointed because again, they would have done it if they had a parent there to consent. Right. Yes. So it brings, it brings me back to that moment. So anyway, moving on. <laughs> 17, right? So it goes back yes. to that whole, what are they willing to do? Right? right. But see, if they put that on you, your parents, oh man, they could have brought that shop down. True. Especially because that's actually permanent. 
Yes, exactly. Well, not now. <laughs> I know, right? But it's a process. Great technology. Yes, exactly. Let's talk really quick about trademarks. When would you want, because again, like I like, I'm going back to when you mentioned LLC that stuck out to me. So if you do have an LLC with your business name in your state, you're protected against anyone else having that name in your state. Is that correct? No, not tech. No, oh. you're not protected from that. You just are oh. now claiming it like on the state level. So it's okay. no one else can file for that uh, name as an LLC or corporation. Okay. But they can still technically use that name. Like they, there's no legal reason you they could put a use lot of people on notice that you own it. The only way to really put everybody on notice and to really claim true ownership is through a trademark. Now, obviously okay. trademark is more complex. We were a first to file or sorry, opposite of that. We are a first to use, not first to file federal nation. So what okay. happens with that is even if, if you are putting a name out there and you're making money, you technically at that moment have a claim for federal trademark protection. But do, does anybody else know that? If you're not, if you're not easily found, if people don't, you don't have a giant online presence and no one knows about it, then someone can swoop in, file a federal trademark. And unless you were watching the USPTO.gov website, they may swoop in and own that name before you federally, sure. unless you filed an opposition un and unless now you, you sue them saying, Hey, I actually used it first, which has happened in the past. Okay. Uh, okay. But then that's a lawsuit, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you do love your name, I always say this. Okay. My first lawyer thing, again, if I put my lawyer hat on and should I file a trademark? I'm like, yes. The second you love your name and the second you're like, uh, I'm making money and I'm using it in commerce, file mm -hmm. that federal trademark. Is it realistic? No. So what do we ask? We ask ourselves, do I love my name? Am I going to be using it forever? If someone else were to file a trademark and taking my name, would I be devastated? That's how I felt about Legal Doer. I thought it was, yeah. I thought it was the stupidest name and I loved it. And I was like, I'm a doer that does. Like it was just, it's just, that was me. And I'm like, I would be devastated if someone took that. That's I filed so it right away, but I'm able to file it myself. So it's, can you, do you have the money to invest in a lawyer to do it? I definitely 110% like would not say to file it yourself. The federal trademark application is very complex and about yes. 50 to 80% of applications are rejected, which means you have to go through the whole thing and your fees are not refunded. Why would it be rejected? Maybe because you didn't do something correctly when you do it you yourself? Do it Is that what you mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or the name wasn't good enough. There are certain requirements. Yeah. You have to have certain name requirements. It can't be general. It can't be descriptive. There, There's a lot of, it's complex. You, you yes. have to first have a trademark worthy name. Yes. So it has to be trademarkable. And then the application is confusing. So you got to pick the correct class because trademarks are, are filed in little buckets. If you go to okay. Target and you look around at the, at the different departments, if you think of Dove, you're like, mm -hmm. what do you think of first? Do you think of the candy bar or do you think of, yes. and how are they both allowed to legally exist? That's because they're in different departments. Yes. So if you walk into Target, you're not getting confused about buying Dove soap when you wanted Dove chocolate, you know exactly where to go. Right? True. Okay. You know exactly where to go. So that's yes. what the classes are. So it's like being able to figure out where to put it. And obviously that's a generalization. If it's chocolate, if it's food, what department to put it in or what class mm -hmm. to put it in. But picking those classes and filing in those classes gets a little bit complex. So that's just where it goes. Yeah. And let's real quick, say you trademark your name, right? And then you, someone else is using it, you find them and you serve like a cease and desist, which I think is what you do. Correct. If yeah. that were to happen. Okay. And yeah. say they just continue, they ignore it and continue to use the name. You would have to obviously take the steps and what would you do at that point? So it depends on where they're using it. If it's, you can do a lot of, you can do a lot of things. But yes, a cease and desist. Also, they really should stop because when there is a trademark violation, there are statutory damages. It, I want to say behooves you, but that's a terrible word. It, <laughs> another <laughs> word for behooves. Um, it's in your best interest to sure. go ahead and go after them because you're going to get your attorney's fees paid for. You're going to get your the cost of the litigation paid for and you're going to get your damages because it's all statutorily driven. Oh, um, got it. Okay. 
And you obviously have to prove some of the damages, but it's more in your benefit to go after them. So yes, cease and desist. You can also potentially do some like takedown requests where you force like the website owner or the website host or the social media platform to deal with it on your behalf. And then obviously, yeah, a lawsuit at the end of the day. Because you do lose your trademark if you don't enforce it. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You could lose it if you don't enforce it? Yeah, it makes your claim weaker. Okay. Good to know. All right. So if you're as Goldilinks, but you're letting a bunch of other people operate under your name, then the law is, then why are we protecting it for you? Mm -hmm. If you're just going to let everybody else use your name, and you're not franchising it, you're not claiming it, you're not giving permission, everybody's just stole it and you don't care, then why are we protecting you? True. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. See, so many things I don't know. It's just so many things. And you know what? But why would you, right? So I'm like, some people like come to me and they're like, they're crying because they're like, oh my God, there's so much I don't know. I'm like, why would you know this stuff? Didn't I know. know. And that's why I'm just a fan of, even you said, if you were to trademark or do anything, like, I'm just a fan knowing how, like in my even past business prior to doing this, like how time consuming it can be to like, literally, if you had to figure out every aspect of business and dive into every single thing, you wouldn't be able to grow your own, yeah, you wouldn't be able to grow your own business because literally literally by the time I researched how to trademark and do everything correctly, I could have been doing something else in my business that really moved the needle forward, like rather than focusing on this that I know is necessary, but it's, it doesn't make sense to do on my own. Like time is money. (laughs) So do you offer trademark help? I'm putting on the spot, but do you offer that? You do? Yes. Yes. Okay. So like, my business is ever expanding. Um, but yes, I do offer that. I also do the start your LLC. So yes, I have a bunch of DIY, do it yourself, templates, checklists, how to run and start your business. And that's more of like the DIY route. And I also have the, I'll do it for you route where it's more yes. of the legal services portion. And I know you, yeah. you've been talking a ton lately, or maybe just what I see current, like lately in your, or the most recent, I, I should say, <laughs> UGC stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, well, I know they have yeah. like very little to do with maybe with a lot of people listening, but I think that if you are going to sell a product and you're going to scale and you're going to, or you already do that with your permanent jewelry and you sell a product and you do have what is user generated content. Yes. What do you need to protect yourself with that? Because it's very interesting. When you were talking about that, I'm like, I would never think you'd need anything in place for that. <laughs> I would Because need- it's all about intellectual property. So something from like your guys' standpoint is maybe you're hiring a UGC creator. Maybe you're hiring that influencer to promote your business, to promote your product. So from the UGC creator's perspective, they are selling you two things. They're selling you their intellectual property rights in the content itself. And they're also selling you their right to publicity, which is their right to monetize or commercialize their image, voice, and likeness. And you want to, as the business owner, Uh either one, want to own the content and the ability to publicize their image, voice, and likeness, Uh or you want to license it and say, I'm going to rent the content and your voice or your image for three months, or I'm going to rent it, AKA license it as a usage right for a year. And I'm going to use it organically on my business's social media page, or I'm going to put paid advertising behind this content creators thing, or I guess that's more of like influencers. There's a difference between UGC creator and influencers. So with the UGC creator, we're handing it to you as the business owner. So as the jeweler, you're going, okay, content creator or UGC creator, I'm going to pay you to create this content and I'm going to use it on my own social media page organically or as a paid ad through my account or influencer. I'm going to hire you for the content and the the commercialization Mm -hmm. of your image for you to post it on your account. And then I'm going to be able to put ad spend behind it through your account. But there is so much legal use that comes around that because it's intellectual property, it's ownership, it's how am I going to pay them, it's how many deliverables does that include? So am I getting two TikToks? Am I getting an Instagram? Right. Am okay. I getting a feed post? Are they allowed to archive it? So say you pay them $1,000 and they post for a day and then they archive it. Dang, did you put that in the contract that they weren't allowed to do that? Or 
What if they all of a sudden the next day go on a binger and you're like, I don't want my brand associated with that influencer now. Like they're oh. doing drugs or they're, they're <laughs> super drunk and like inappropriate online. And I don't want that for my brand. Is there something in that contract to, to prevent that from happening? And then do you get your money back or do you still own it? So there's just a lot of what ifs to okay. protect. Okay. Yes, and, right and you do have some UGC contract stuff, like templates as well, don't you? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have that like for, a- I have the, for the actual, for the creator. And then I have it as the business hiring creator because you're going to have different legal considerations. Because even if you have a verbal agreement, again, that means nothing, right? Like yes. If you are a business hiring them, you're so screwed because they could, <laughs> they own it, right? So just because you paid them for it, you don't own it unless you get it in writing. Like you have no rights. You basically just like voluntarily gave them money. <laughs> like they can yeah. do whatever they want. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, because even when you said that, it's like, oh, say I got a UGC, like a review or something really cool and I wanted to boost the post, but I didn't, yeah. and I wanted to make it an ad, like you said, but they... There was no agreement to that. They could come after me for I yeah. that all the time, unfortunately. I just really? did that for a creator. She gets paid like 2500 for every post. And I just got this brand to pay her $4,000 because they used it for three weeks or it was like a month and we reduced it and they had to pay her $4,000 because they basically stole her intellectual property because their contract was only for organic. It was never for paid ads. And oh, yeah, like you're really like, you're stealing their intellectual property, unfortunately. Okay. See, these are things I just don't, that's not how my mind works. It's but crazy. Especially because you said, you like, feel like you have some ownership if you're paying someone for something and you can yeah, do whatever you want with it. But yeah, but not when it comes to like photographers, not when it comes to like creative things. So under intellectual property, it's not who's paying for it. It's who creates it. Mm-hmm. So if a photographer is taking pictures of your jewelry or of your brand, make sure that they've given you a license to use it however you want. Or maybe they have limitations on that. Maybe as a photographer, they're like, hey, I don't want you taking out the background. I don't want you changing the, the imagery of it. I don't want you mm-hmm. doing any touch ups to it. That's my creative work. Or but if you buy these photos from them and they don't make you sign a contract, though, saying that you can't edit that however these different things you can do with it, could they still come, come after you because you bought it from, you bought this, these photos from them. It doesn't matter. They haven't trans, they have not transferred intellectual property of that photograph to you. So they still own it technically. Even though you bought it. But you didn't buy it. (laughs) You're (laughs) because you have under the law, you, yes, you paid them to do it, but there was no written transfer of ownership. Okay. Great idea. A great thing to know for photographers too, right? Like, I don't think that's. <laughs> yeah. If they wanted to screen you, they could. But it's yeah. always just like, sometimes like you have a friendly relationship with your photographer yeah. and you're like, maybe it won't, maybe it won't happen. Maybe they're fine with it, but it's right. always better to just be like, Hey, cause that's like when I was doing brand photos, that's like what I looked for. I was like, I need to be able to crop them. I need to be able to change yes. it. I need to be able to remove yes. the background because I'm using this for my marketing purposes. And they're like, she wanted me to give credit to her. She wanted me to leave like her brand on it. I was like, no, because I'm using it for commercial purposes. So a lot of times when photographers are doing it for personal, for personal use, they don't have as many restrictions on it. But Mm -hmm. when you're using it for commercial purposes, that's when they tend to put on more restrictions. Okay. Awesome. Good to know. Because I've got my mind's just turning. I was I'm yeah. like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And like, I think this is coming into play a lot too. I actually saw it. I actually just it made me think. There was someone had posted in the group that they were like they use their own personal photos of jewelry, and someone took mm-hmm. it from their account. Right? They probably screenshot it. So easy to steal a photo, or whatever. As like now with online, and then say you were. She, I think she did reach out to her and ask her to take it down. I'm not sure where it went from there, but it just brought me to that story because that is something that I guess, because even if you do a Google image search, you assume you can just use that image, but you probably, can you use those yeah. or no? no? Can't. Right? Okay. You can't because they are copyright protected by whoever created them. So unless they're giving you a license or they're like, <clears throat> they relinquish like royalties to it basically, 
Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times there's a government website that you can go to where it's it's not copyrighted, but it's for the public domain. I agree with you. It's it's so hard because it's, but it's on the internet, it's, but that's not the public domain. Okay. Or so the way you can copyright. use photos, the way you can use photos is obviously belonging to somewhere where it allows you to like, maybe like a stock photo website. That's yes, obviously right. Canva. Yeah. Or Canva because right. they give you the license. They've figured that yeah. out. Okay. With whoever created it, they got mm -hmm. the license for you. But that also has limitations. Mm -hmm. If you look under Canva, a lot of people that do the print to t-shirts get in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. because there's certain things under Canva where that actually isn't part of our licensing agreement with you. Or like with digital products, they're like certain parts of our graphics, you actually can only send a link. You can't have a thing where they are able to edit it. And there's mm -hmm. so many different requirements. So whatever platform you're on, you are going to want to look for what is the licensing agreement for the images, the music, all that stuff? Yeah, I know the music is a huge thing too. Huge. Yeah. And those record labels do not mess around. So if you are creating content for your brand, be careful. Don't use commercially or as a business. Make sure you're using the business account that shows you what you can use commercially. Because they do not mess around. They will come after you. Is there a limit to how long you can play the music too? I thought there was a limit to that. Or no, is that? No, limited? there's not. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, you know what? You're not the only one that thinks that. I think that was okay. just like a myth that was spread around, but there is no limit. Even if you use a second of it. Really? Um, okay. Well, people okay. will maybe recognize it, but That's um, there's no like within... partial feeling. You can use it within even the songs we can use on Reels and Instagram, for example. Why is that possible? I guess through, through the platform because like, you can't share it. And it doesn't usually, if you share it too, it doesn't, the music doesn't come with it. Even if you share it, you save it to your phone, the music, sometimes it's always inside the app. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And also there's a difference. So sometimes if you're in TikTok and you use that video, it may, the, you may not be able to use it over on Instagram because they have okay. different licensing agreements with the record labels and Sony. Oh gosh, there's so many. But TikTok mm -hmm. has its own, hey, these are the ones that we have purchased the license so you can commercially use these, these songs. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram and Facebook actually make it terribly difficult to figure out what is allowed and not. But they have their own separate agreements on mm -hmm. what music can be used. Okay. I know. Like you said, honestly, again, these are all things to just be aware of. And also the things that might happen again, even with someone coming after for an injury or something like that happening is obviously so few and far between. But again, you never know what can happen. Case in point being- It could be life-ruining. It could potentially be life-ruining in a way. Exactly. So that's a thing. They aren't small things. So if something does happen, heaven forbid, which is why we why we protect ourselves with insurance and yeah. all the things we do. You never want to deal with it. But then once you have a claim, gosh, you are so right. glad that you did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. And it's something to be aware of. What's funny, it just brings me a couple of things I've done that I just didn't even think of like in the past. So there was this long time ago, I, I had my jewelry on Etsy one of the times and I, I named a pair of earrings Harpo Hoops. And Harpo is Oprah, right? That's her yeah. That's her company. So they contacted me and told oh, yeah. me to take it down. I was like, oh my gosh. So I'm, like, I'm just some little person selling my care. earrings on Etsy. I had no idea, right? I don't, yeah. I just, my mind doesn't work that way. I don't think about, I actually had also some violation. Yeah. Yeah. So of course I'm, so you get scared. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm taking it down right now. I'm so sorry. Tell Oprah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, it was Oprah because if it was Disney, man, they go after people and they do not let up. They don't care that you're a mom and pop. They will take every penny from you and shut you down. Really? So that, that's also something, again, this, again, we could have a conversation forever because when it comes to people talked about that too, about using certain words that are like copyrighted or even, yeah, the whole, I think using Disney type of like jewelry components and stuff. I think you have careful. to be yeah. careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Because, and I would steer clear of Disney because they really? don't mess around. They enforce their stuff like no other. So it's, they own their characters. They own the names. They own Disney. They own the trademarks and they enforce them like crazy. So say and you made a necklace or something that had like a Mickey looking charm or something that you made or whatever like they we can't do that legally no not unless okay. you have not unless it was from disney and it's a disney licensed mickey mouse head no interesting oh my gosh so many things I know. like and even certain i think isn't it certain terms you can't use obviously 
Does that using, I thought I heard something about using the word smiley face or something like something was copyrighted where you couldn't use. Oh yeah. The, there's some things that are just like outlandish. It's when they trademark a phrase or slogan. Trademark a phrase. But it, and there was like a thing about the candles, right? There was a thing about a candle names were being filed for a trademark or copyright. And there was like, wait, what? And they're putting all these candle makers. They had to rename their candles, but mm-hmm. it has to also be like within your same niche too. Okay. So if you have, it has to be like other jewelers that have claimed that tagline. So it's well, like- that also happened to me. So I, someone came to me to stamp <laughs> and I, I talked about this in another episode actually, where they, a, a customer had come to me asking me to stamp this quote in a, like a bar pendant. And I did it and I posted it on my Instagram and I got contacted almost right away, like within the 24 hours of me posting saying that it was a, whether it was a trademarked quote, because they also had, the quote was on many different things. I think it was like a fitness brand or a fitness influencer. And because it was like an inspirational quote and it was on a piece of jewelry. She very much similar to what I made because obviously they just wanted me to make it at a cheaper price. I, I made this like basically what they sell as well, not knowing that because a customer just came to me asking me to make that. And then I was like, again, very apologetic. I had no idea. Someone just had me. So yeah. Whether they're in their rights, right? They're right. So they're enforcing what's called dupes. And you really particularly need to be careful with that. If you ever start selling your jewelry on TikTok shop, they do not, they take that very seriously. So if you were to sell that necklace on TikTok shop and the person notified TikTok shop, they would not only shut down your account, but they would take all the money that was in your account and you'd never be back on the platform again. Like they are so meticulous about dupes. So I guess I would absolutely be careful with that. Okay. Yeah. So on TikTok though, like if you, if they're, what do they consider a dupe? Like how is, how do they know which one came first? You know what I mean? Like when it comes to. So if they like a Stanley cup, right? So this is a real life example. There was a creator on there who thought it was a Stanley cup. So I actually feel really bad for her because she was promote, she promoted it and she got shut down. She lost like $10,000 in her (sighs) shop account. And there was no like intentional or non-intentional way around it. She's like, I literally thought it was a Stanley cup, but it was a dupe. But there's also the thing where it's like, if you didn't, there's no, I didn't know this was the exact same necklace as this other person's, right? The customer had you do it. There's no excuse there, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Just, wow. You need to make your own original works. It needs to come from your brain. And obviously if you're oh, like- Oh, for sure. But I'm like saying like, how do they judge that? How do they know that you're the dupe and maybe the other person wasn't the dupe? Does that make sense? Well, like yeah. how do they know? Well, I guess in case with necklaces and creative necklaces and quotes and stuff, that would be more of a proof where you're like, here's a picture of the day I created it. Right. It would have to be, there'd probably be more evidence gathering, sure. but obviously since Stanley Cup has been around for over a hundred years, so Stanley was first and also- oh, yeah, of course, yeah. That's That's more of a, It was more of a copycat situation, but yeah, if it comes more to the creative jewelry aspect and how long you've been selling it and is it the name, if it's Goldie Link's necklace- but you're creating a dupe of Pandora necklaces and then it's you were copying Pandora, right? But there's right. a difference. Where we both came up with this idea and it's not like you're actually copying it or trying to sell it as a Pandora necklace. Obviously right. there's some creative and giveness there. Okay. All right. Wrapping Woo. up because again, we can keep talking forever, but I really <laughs> advise people to follow you on Instagram because you have so many amazing nuggets. And I feel like that is something just again, to keep up on. And I'm, I even saw you had something about the legitimacy, the legitimacy of an LLC. And if you don't have this file and I'm like, oh my God, like I would have never known that if I didn't start right. following you and just look through these videos. And it's a great way to stay informed. Okay, and then I'm also, so glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And But is there anything else that I feel like we haven't covered that you think anyone should be aware of or anything that's missing, I feel? No, I feel like this is a good like stepping stone of just, hey, what are the biggest concerns when it comes to permanent jewelry and what do you need to look out for? And it's Mm -hmm. getting your business set up correctly, figuring out what makes sense for you personally, because yeah, the legalese is there, the law is there, but what makes sense for you on your business journey and what gives you that peace of mind? What is the legal foundation and future that you have for your business? Mm-hmm. Right. And so it all comes down to also more of a personal thing. And obviously, if you need legal help, I'm here if and when you need me. Just okay. head over to Legal Doer. It's super easy. <laughs> oh, cool. Legal Doer, Legal you know, Doer. Ask, yeah. Where do we find you? Where do we find you? Yeah. Legal Doer, right? 
Legal Doer. Yeah. So on Instagram, it's Legal Doer. That's where I'm most heavily active and then LegalDoer.com for my website. Perfect. And like I said, we are, I'll link some things in the show notes and we are going to have a waiver that you can yes. like a template that you can use. So that's perfect. We, yeah. So you don't have to think about it. <laughs> exactly. That's what I want. Okay. Check that well, off. Thank you so it. much for educating us today and making my mind spin. I'm going to be like thinking about this stuff all day long, but all the legal crazy, but it's good to know that we have you to lean on. You have on. resources. <laughs> yes. You have resources. You don't have to struggle alone. You don't have to do this and you don't have to be stressed out. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. Once you get it down and you have a road plan or like an action plan and you're able to make those decisions, I swear legal can actually be empowering. I agree. I think it's just a peace of mind. Like I said, if I know I have things in place or in the back of my mind, I know that, Hey, I don't have, I don't have a waiver. I don't have that. And it's always like in the back of my mind. And it's just so it's a peace of mind knowing that you just have everything in place. And like you said, it's, it might be a little bit just not enjoyable it's again, more enjoyable with you for sure. And having templates and making it easy. But once you have those things in place, like they're in place, right? Yeah, it's do it again. Yeah, exactly. it's there. It's done. Easy peasy. Yes, for sure. Yes. Rather than dealing with the ramifications, if something were to go wrong, it would wrong be worse. In place. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. The headache now is so much better than the headache later. Right. <laughs> and it's going to be more costly too. Woo. Yes. So much more costly. Thank you so much for having me. This yes, has been of course. absolutely wonderful. It's been really fun. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you Bye, soon. Jennifer. Bye. Well, how do you feel? I hope this episode inspired you in some way. I would love to hear from you. So visit me on Instagram at Goldie Links Jewelry or at my website at goldie-links.com. I'm always down to chat. <laughs> Have a golden day and I'll see you next time.